If we look, for example, at a molecule like amoxicillin, there's just absolutely no way that we could fit that into a, a reasonable, meaningful, condensed formula. Even representing rings with a condensed formula gets, gets rather tricky. And if we look at the full-blown Lewis structure here, there's tons of visual complexity, tons of lines, tons of dots, tons of letters. This is way too complicated to draw any useful information out of it and anything resembling an efficient amount of time, right? It's just too complicated. So we've developed a shorthand to hide a lot of that visual complexity without sacrificing important aspects of the structure that are relevant to its properties and reactivity, the properties and reactivity of the compound. And these are known as bond line structures. The first thing that bond line structures do is take every cat carbon atom and basically just erase it saying that at every confluence of bonds, everywhere where bonds come together, there is a carbon located there. So for example, this is just two of many examples in the structure of amoxicillin. We've got a carbon here where we see three bonds coming together. We've got a carbon here where we see four bonds coming together. The wedges and dashes we'll touch on in a second. These are meant to represent three-dimensional information within the structure. The geometry is also, in, in bond line structures, is, is closer to the um, sort of nature accurate geometry. For example, 109.5 degree bond angles at tetrahedral carbon. Carbons linked by triple bonds are typically drawn with linear geometry because that is their actual geometry in the true molecule, right? That's just Vesper theory at work. Now, one thing we'll notice about these carbons, in particular this one highlighted at the top here, is that it appears to only have three bonds and six total electrons. But this is another aspect of the bond line shorthand. There's a hydrogen missing here. And it's assumed that each carbon bears enough so-called implied hydrogen atoms to satisfy the octet rule, to have eight electrons total. So for example here, this carbon, if we just look at the black bonds, appears to only have three bonds, six total electrons. This means there's an implied hydrogen at that carbon that we can draw in, and it's a good idea to draw these in at carbons in the vicinity of a reactive center, or a place where, for whatever reason, we're paying attention to that carbon atom. We should generally draw in all the implied hydrogens. This implied hydrogen here brings that carbon up to four bonds. It satisfies the octet rule. Finally, lone pairs. Lone pairs are often omitted in bond line structures, but again, we assume that there are enough lone pairs there that the atom is satisfying the octet rule. So this oxygen, for example, appears to only have two bonds, one to this H and one to this carbon, only four total electrons. It's got two lone pairs to bring it up to satisfying the octet rule and its formal charge, its neutral formal charge. This atom has six electrons formally for the purposes of the, of the formal charge electron count. And, uh, and so we can omit those and we can draw those in. And again, when you're pushing electrons or thinking about electrons doing things, it's a very, very good idea to go ahead and draw these in. And you'll see me do this when we work through reaction mechanisms and, and um, reaction products and things later in the course. Hydrogens. Let's loop back to hydrogens for a second. At heteroatoms, which are neither carbon nor hydrogen, hydrogens are never omitted. Hydrogens linked to heteroatoms are never left out. We've got to show the number of hydrogens linked to any non-carbon atom. So here, for example, OH, this H could never be omitted. In H here, this H is always drawn in. When that H is missing, that tends to actually be a reactive intermediate, as we'll see later in the course. So it's very important to show the number of hydrogens linked to a heteroatom in these bond line structures. Let's practice drawing in implied hydrogens and recognizing implied carbons in the structure of diazepam, which you may know better as the drug Valium. All right, let's start with the carbons. And here again, I think it helps to number just to make sure that we account for all the carbons rather systematically. There's a carbon at every confluence of bonds. Everywhere where, where we see the structure kind of bend or two bonds come together, there's a carbon there without a letter. Of course, if you see a letter, that's the element symbol for the element uh, of the atom that's sitting there. So for example, here we have a carbon here, here, and here, there, there, and there. We've got a ring of carbons linked together in a cyclic structure, and this is known as a six-membered ring because there are six carbons in the ring, and that's six of the carbons that we've accounted for. We can also recognize a carbon here, 
and there, and there, as well as one hanging off of the nitrogen here. And don't forget about these hanging bonds where there's a CH3 group or methyl group located. So we've accounted for four more carbons here. We've got the methyl carbon, eight, nine, and 10. And then here we can see another six-membered ring that's actually structurally quite similar to the first one we recognized with those alternating double and single bonds. You'll see those again later in your studies of organic chemistry. And that's six more carbons, bringing up our total to 16. All right, now let's turn our attention to the implied hydrogens. And the big idea here is the number of hydrogens is the number necessary to bring each carbon up to satisfying the octet rule. So for example, we can look at carbon 14 and see that we've got three bonds at that carbon right now. One, two, three. It needs a fourth to satisfy the octet rule. So there is one implied hydrogen at that carbon and we can draw that in and we'll do that here in a second. Before we do that, I just want to point out that carbons 12, 13, 15, and 16 have this same bonding pattern, right? One double bond, one single bond, total bonds of three, so there's one implied hydrogen at each of those carbons. And check out carbon 11. Carbon 11 is satisfying the octet rule as drawn, four bonds there. So there are no implied hydrogens at carbon 11. All right, so here are all our implied hydrogens in that sort of upper ring. If we look now at the other six-membered ring, we see similar bonding patterns in play, right? Carbons two, six, five, and four, uh, and three have, well, carbons two, six, and five have three bonds total and one implied hydrogen at each carbon. Carbons one, four, and three are already satisfying the octet rule. One, two, three, four bonds at carbon one drawn explicitly. Same thing at carbon three, one, two, three, and four, and same thing at carbon four, one, two, three, and four. So no implied hydrogens at carbons one, three, and four in this structure. Now if we turn our attention to kind of the southeastern ring, now let's look at carbon seven first. There's a carbon here at the end of this line, and it seems to only have one explicit bond drawn. This means that it's going to need three implied hydrogens to satisfy the octet rule. And there are three implied hydrogens there. It's a methyl group. Carbon 9, we've got two bonds drawn explicitly. And so to satisfy the octet rule, we need two more hydrogens there. So we're going to have a CH2 group at carbon 9. Carbon 10, already good to go. Notice we have one, two, three, four bonds at carbon 10 already. No implied hydrogens there. So there we filled in carbon nine and carbon seven. And at this point, we've accounted for all of the implied hydrogens in the structure. So again, the key idea here is we wanna satisfy the octet rule at every carbon. Also the formal charge, which we'll come back to a, a little bit later, but each of these carbons is neutral, implying that it needs four electrons, formally speaking, valence electron count to four, if you like. And these numbers of implied hydrogens also guarantee that. So overall, we found 16 carbons, 13 hydrogens, and the molecular formula of diazepam is C16H13ClNO2. This slide summarizes the conventions for bond line structures. You'll use these every day. Every day you study organic chemistry, you will use these conventions. So they're super important to keep in mind. Number one, carbon atoms in a straight chain of single bonds should be drawn in a zigzag format. Double bonds also. The exception is sp hybridized carbons where the geometry is linear. We should draw these uh, sp hybridized atoms uh, with straight line bonds to represent the linear geometry faithfully. When you draw double bonds, make sure to depict the trigonal planar geometry properly with a 120 degree bond angle. And this is natural if you're used to the zigzag format for single bonds. It's by convention, really, the same bond angle is used for double and single bonds since they're pretty close, right? 109.5 and 120 degrees are pretty close, so we tend to pretty much draw them the same way, and that's fine in bond line structures. When drawing single bonds, keep in mind, single bonds can rotate. So compounds containing single bonds can often be drawn in a number of different ways. This gets to an important structural concept known as conformation that we'll dig into in more detail later in the course. So for example, these two structures here, notice we've got four carbons in both, 
we've got all single bonds and actually the numbers of hydrogens at each carbon match. CH3, CH3, CH2, 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 and CH3, CH3. So these look very, very similar. The only difference is this bond is aligned kind of down like this, and this bond is aligned sort of up and to the right like this. But these are the exact same compound. And we know this because that central carbon-carbon bond, rotation about that bond is possible. And if we just swing that bond on the right around, we'll get exactly the structure on the left. These are different conformations of the same compound. And for our purposes here, equivalent representations. Generally, rotation about a single bond is going to give you an equivalent representation of the molecule that you start with. And where there are exceptions to that idea, we'll tackle that when we discuss conformation later in the course. We've already mentioned that heteroatoms are bonds that are not carbon or hydrogen. And all heteroatoms must be drawn explicitly using their element symbol. We also have to show all hydrogens connected to any heteroatoms to avoid accidentally drawing a reactive intermediate. And so doing something like this should be avoided. We want to make sure to include the two H's linked to that nitrogen in the structure. So this is good, this not good. Never, 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 rule number five, draw a carbon atom with more than four bonds. This is colloquially known as a Texas carbon because everything's bigger in Texas, and you never, never, never want to do this because carbon never exceeds an octet of electrons. Carbon never violates the octet rule with an excess uh, more than eight electrons. And so you want to avoid doing this like the plague. This is a very easy idea to forget once you get into reactions later in the course and in your Organic Chemistry 2 course. I've, I see it a lot in Organic Chemistry 2 when this discussion of bond line structures is ancient history. But keep it in mind, never draw more than five, four bonds to a carbon always four bonds or less. And less is actually okay, and we'll see that in reactive intermediates primarily moving forward. Let's build familiarity with bond line structures now, converting this full-blown Lewis structure into a bond line structure. The first thing I want to do is number the carbons, and I'm going to label them with some highlighting just to help us distinguish between the carbons. And let's start with the carbon we labeled 1 and just connect carbons 1 and 2. In a bond line structure, we can ignore hydrogen. So I'm going to add the hydrogens back in at the very end, but for the time being, all we have to draw is one stick. This indicates the carbon 1, carbon 2 bond, and carbons 1 and 2 are sitting on the ends of this stick. Now, carbon 2 is connected to another methyl group, carbon 3. So we're going to add another stick coming off of carbon 2, and on the other end of that, that's carbon 3. And these two methyl groups are essentially equivalent to each other, which is why I highlighted them both in blue. They are basically the same, structurally speaking, for our purposes. Now, carbon-2 is also linked to this carbon highlighted in orange, which is carbon-4. And that carbon has a double bond to oxygen. And so I've gone ahead and drawn that here. Um, notice I've actually omitted the lone pairs, and I'm not going to add them back in. This is okay to do in a bond line structure. We assume that oxygen has enough lone pairs to satisfy the octet rule. In this case, and in many, many others involving oxygen in organic compounds, there are two lone pairs. Finally, carbon-4 is linked to carbon-5, highlighted in purple here. And there it is. And again, we don't need to draw in the hydrogens, since there are three hydrogens assumed on the end of carbon-5 there, so that carbon-5 satisfies the octet rule. So we could, if we wanted to, add back in the implied hydrogens, particularly at specific places that may be important from a reactivity point of view. For example, when you get to organic chemistry 2, you'll learn that carbons 2 and 5 in this particular compound are particularly important and particularly acidic. And so drawing in implied hydrogens at those carbons can be useful and important. But Notice that the bond line structure implies the number of hydrogens at each carbon, so we can add those back just using ideas about the octet rule. 